Um, could I ask when you look at your, your trading right now, is there any kind of a uh, personal issue that you say like, yeah, this is the thing I'm, you know, kind of working on right now. That's kind of creeping back in with my performance or something. Um, I mean, Mr. Moritz, how are you? Welcome to the channel. Thanks for stopping by. Hi, I'm great. Thanks. <laughs> Very nice to see you. How was your weekend? Uh, weekend, uh, not bad. Yeah, I was uh, hiking a bit and uh, did some barbecue with my family. It was fantastic, actually. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you this. By, by way of getting off, I know we're right in the middle of a, a trading day here, but could you start us off with just telling us how would you describe your approach to the market? Oh, I'm basically a day trader. Um, it depends on how much time I have on my hands. Sometimes, for example, uh, two weeks ago, they released this fantastic video game, Baldur's Gate 3. And uh, if I have things like that coming up, I will trade the higher time frames. But mostly I'm a day trader in the FX space and mostly trend following. I do have some mean reversion strategies. So I have a portfolio of multiple strategies that I'm running. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. Okay, so mostly you like to day trade unless there's something very important happening um around the world for you and <laughs> then you it. might go to higher time frames so you um you're trading fx you said how many products are you keeping an eye on i i reduced it a lot because uh, i used to be a poker player full-time and back then when i was playing poker uh, it was the, the games were so so soft that uh, i was playing 24 tables online it was constant action and when i switched to trading I tried to emulate that action because I got really bored just looking at those charts, man. They were moving like a snail. So I tried trading the second charts, but uh, the spread was a too big in the FX space. Then maybe you could do it in futures, but then I simply had a lot of pairs on, right? Uh, I recently reduced that because I'm getting older um, to 28 pairs. So all the majors. And then I have the indices as well. The standard indices, Dow Jones, the DAX. Um, because I live in Hong Kong, I take a look at the Hang Seng in the morning. And the um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Okay, but still 30 plus products? Yes, yes. Wow, wow. Well, okay. So what, what is your what is your preparation like? How do you filter out what to what to be looking for? So because I'm a day trader. I have to be very, I, I cannot look at um, 28 pairs at the same time. And I also, uh, because I do travel a lot, uh, at least I used to, I recently married. So that's going to. Congratulations. Be, thanks. That's going to um, reduce a bit. Um, so now I have a fancy office with uh, three monitors and I look like a real trader. Um, before that, I used to only trade from my laptop. So I, I need a very good scanning process in the morning. Basically, for my trend following strategies, I simply take a look at what moved during Asia or what uh, moved during last New York session and then just consolidate it during Asia. And then I'm looking for a continuation of that move. So I have very specific parameters that allow me to narrow down the list in the morning to a couple of pairs. Sometimes, some days I don't have any trades because yeah, DFX space doesn't trend every day. I thought about moving to US stocks because I can find something that moves every day, but somehow was too lazy and FX works well enough for me. So I'm fine with not having a trade some days. Yeah, so you just need a very good scanning process in the morning. That takes me 30 minutes roughly, uh, where I go through each pair on the higher time frames. So daily, I go down from the daily, the four hour to the one hour. I have my moving averages. I see what's what's trending nicely. And then I pick three to five pairs and I try to catch an entry during the London session or the New York session, right? Okay, 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 got it. So day trading, um, I'm guessing pretty exclusively relying on indicators, like moving averages for the method or are you using discretion at all? There's definitely an element of discretion involved, which I... I'm always reminded of when I teach people my strategies. I'm always astounded. I like to think of myself as a okay teacher, not the worst. But then when I teach people my strategy first and they show me the trades they take, I'm very surprised sometimes. <laughs> and I would never take those trades myself. So I have to ask uh, what's going on here. So, uh, okay, most of the time I can find the rule they broke. 
but some sometimes I don't find any rules they broke. So I have a checklist that every trade has to fulfill. But then on top of that, I add my discretion and my experience of 10 years uh, trading. And then sometimes I can't even explain. I can only tell them I don't like this. I don't like how it looks. That's it, right? So I would say I'm 70% rules-based, 30% discretionary. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've tried hard to automate my strategies with a friend of mine who tried it for a year or two. Uh, it simply did not work. Uh, no chance. Very interesting. Okay. Now, what? Uh, how long have you been in Hong Kong? And what made you move there? Was it your um, was it your wife or what, what brought you to Hong Kong? Well, the first time I went to China was in 2010. Um, I visited a friend who was doing an internship there with a, with a German company. Um, and that was in Beijing, actually. And I loved it so much that one month later, I moved there myself. Uh, ah. I, I got a, a student visa uh, for studying language in China, basically. And I just moved there. That That time, I was still playing poker. Yeah, so I did that for a while. Then I traveled around Asia for a while. For the last 10 years, basically, I have been all around Asia. And uh, I loved Hong Kong the most of all the places where I've been to. And then I met my wife there too. So all good. Yeah. Wow, wow. Very, uh, yeah, very nice story. I feel like uh, I feel on a similar life path. Um, I travel a lot right now mm -hmm. and um, I really enjoy it. But if I ever found a spot that, you know, felt more like home, then, uh, you know, I would, I would uh, hang it up and put down some roots, get myself three monitors like yourself and just call it a day. <laughs> Very good. It's not okay. it's not an easy transition. It's not an easy switch at all. But uh, now I got my motorbike and, uh, you know, you can do day trips into China or like weekend trips and so on. So I still get that freedom feeling and being on the road without uh, sacrificing family life. So it's not too bad. Sure. So get you a little, yeah, you're fixing. Um, <laughs> so kind of a weird time, I would imagine, in the markets, uh, you know, given where you're at. So what what is your normal schedule like, let's say, from the time you wake up to the, what you do before you start trading to what trading looks like for you? And then if you have any kind of aftermarket routines, could you walk us through that? Yeah. When I'm in Hong Kong uh, or in Asia, generally, I don't trade in the mornings. I don't trade the Asia session. Uh, typically, um, I could, but... I have always been a, a horrible early riser. So I like to wake up without an alarm clock. Uh, usually I sleep until 8, 8 or 9 a.m. And then uh, I go to the beach first. Uh, that's that's what I typically do. Uh, either I go for a hike or I go to the beach <laughs> hmm. in the morning. And I go surfing a bit, swimming. That's fantastic. Yeah, I love it. Then I, lunchtime, usually I go to a restaurant. Sometimes I cook for my wife. Most of the time I go to a restaurant and then at 2 p.m. Uh, London opens. Um, so 1 p.m. I start my market prep. I do my uh, a little bit of a meditation, something to calm down. And then I start my market prep, uh, the trend scan. Yeah. And then I trade from 2 to roughly 5 p.m. So three hours of the London session. And then it's time for dinner. And then after dinner, if I'm in a good mood or I'm, let's say I have good energy levels, I will trade the New York session as well, which in summer starts at 9 p.m. In winter, it starts at 10 p.m., so that's a bit late. But uh, I try to trade the first two to three hours of the New York session as well then. Then I do my journaling after that. So usually I sleep around 1 a.m. or so. I try doing journaling the next morning. It's not the same because you, you do forget a lot of the details. and the emotions you had when you were in the trade. I tr take a lot of notes while I'm in trades, and then I instantly chill those whenever I have a free minute. So that's pretty much it. Yeah, my aftermarket routine is um, it's always the same. Yeah, so it's always journaling the trades and then um, writing down some notes: uh, what went good today, what went bad today, um, what can I do better tomorrow. And then I pat myself on my on my shoulder, congratulate myself if I done well. And um, next day, same same old same old. Very interesting. Now you said uh, a few things I thought were very nice around there. One to highlight the idea of trying to journal the next day, um, and I agree that it's very interesting. But I think if you're not doing it as close to real time, or at least very quickly after. Um, what you think you remember is very deceptive and it's, it's, it gets, 
increasingly far away from actual reality. And there just gets to be all these gaps. Um, journaling, or if you if you are in a process of wanting to keep notes of stuff, very important that you do that the day of and as close to real time as possible. And um, you know, and then you can do something with that maybe the next day, but but very important to get the information the day of. I, I agree. And it's funny, you said that, that you don't like to use an alarm to wake up. I, um, I, I'm on that same boat. I haven't used an alarm in a long time unless I need to catch an early <laughs> flight or, or something. And on the rare yeah. occasion when I do need to set an alarm and that's how I wake up, it just, it's such a weird, it, it's weird that it's so normal. Everybody I think uses one, but mm. to wake up by this thing, just kind of grabbing your attention as opposed to just waking up when your body's ready. Um, I feel exactly. so fortunate that that's like, the, you know, a way I get to live my life, but um, waking up to an alarm. I, I have the realization every once in a while and it, it's just like, Oh, what a horrible way to start the day. Yeah. Your whole day is ruined basically. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. So what does a weekend look like for you? Do you ever do anything market related or on the weekends? Do you try to completely detach from the markets on purpose? What's the routine there? Yeah, I try to, um, I try to stay away from the markets. Uh, usually, yeah, I like to go on these motorbike trips or I go camping uh, just hmm. try to spend as much time as I can in nature because that's really my balancing um, act, yeah, which which helps me to really uh, recoup uh, no matter how, how bad the week went or how well it went. It just resets you on a level that is impossible to achieve for me personally with any other activity. When I was younger, I would just get drunk like crazy and party hard. And uh, that was also a great reset. But... Um, <laughs> Now that hangovers is they last like three days. And uh I mean I'm 36 now and yeah, I'm not getting healthier. So um I tried to find something else. Um that works really well for me. I love cooking. You know, I do uh I, I play the guitar, just anything that is analog. Yeah. Uh, I try to stay away for as far as I can from the digital world. Because during the week when we have dinner, to be honest, uh, we watch Netflix too and so on. So during the during the weekend, I'm just I say to my wife, okay, turn off the Wi-Fi, <laughs> leave me alone with that stuff, and that's it. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, what is trade society? Trade society. It started. So it's it's a funny story because me and Rolf we met uh, on an uh, online forum years ago, uh, 2013. Yeah. And uh, he was working for a big corporation. I was working for a big corporation and we both said, this sucks. And um, I actually, when I met him, he already had quit his job. And I was looking for a peer group because I wanted to quit my job and uh, travel. So I was looking for a peer group and I found this crazy German dude on the internet who travels through Thailand uh, and uh, is trading. And so I contacted him and we became buddies. Then he had this idea that trading itself is, I mean... It can be fulfilling, but it's it's not everything, right? And you need something else outside of trading to kind of balance this um, this activity. Trading is not very creative, I would say. It's more rep a repetitive task if you have your strategies and everything down. So he started the blog. And uh, I had a blog for poker before where I was writing about poker strategies and so on. So I always enjoyed that as well. And then we thought, okay, let's just start writing about uh, trading. Yeah. And we started that in Thailand in 2014, so 10 years ago almost. And in the beginning, it was purely a blog to try to find um, like-minded people and try to connect with the community and so on. And after a while, we had so many visitors that we became ambitious <laughs> and we said, okay, let's start a Twitter account and a YouTube account and a podcast and uh, this and that. And uh, now we're everywhere. And um, after a while, people started asking us to um, train them or teach them. And then we started selling video courses as well. And now we have a live chat room um, for traders as well and so on. And I try to keep the, uh, like trading has always been my first priority. And then the second priority are my students and everything else just comes after that. Uh, don't tell my wife. <laughs> <laughs> So that's basically trade society. Yeah, it's uh, it's um, it's our baby. It's our way to um, express ourselves when we are not trading. Yeah? So I enjoy it. Yeah. Mm. What are your thoughts on backtesting? It's an interesting topic. It's it's important to I, I would say 
uh, you can get a lot of experience in in a short amount of time as opposed to forward testing with the demo account, for example. Um, but obviously the backtest results, whenever I do a backtest, the uh, live, live results always look very different because there's no emotions involved and there's no time factor involved because you can just fast forward and so on. But to prove the basic edge of a strategy, it's fantastic. So you can do that in an afternoon. Uh, you have an idea and you test it over 30 trades. Then you know, does this have a basic edge or is this absolute trash? And that's fantastic. Yeah. So it's a great tool to do just that. I think it's also a great way to gain exposure to setups. So then you can build this, this memory bank in your brain of pattern recognition, especially for us uh, pattern-based traders or indicator-based traders. You get this experience in this is what a good trade looks like and what it feels like this discretion yeah uh, and then you can um, definitely get a quicker um or or a steeper learning curve yeah that that helps a lot it's not a tool i would say where okay i have back tested the strategy for 100 trades and i was positive now i'm gonna take a ten thousand dollar account and uh, <laughs> do exactly the same thing in live markets that's not how it works. It's a totally different game. But proving the edge of a strategy, getting exposure to setups, great, fantastic. Yeah, I think everyone should do it. What is the actual process for backtesting? Completely manual, just backing up the charts and looking for the setup? Or do you use some kind of sophistication? I have always used a software called Forex Tester, which simply gives you um, a live environment. So in, in FX, everyone uses MetaTrader 4, and this Forex tester looks and feels like MetaTrader 4 uh, simply with historical data. And you can do that for the last 20 years they have data. So you can jump to any year, 2008, January, and start your test there. And then you can fast forward uh, in any speed you like. And uh, with multiple charts, you can open orders, you can buy, sell. It's a fantastic tool. Yeah, And that, that's how I do it, basically. And I still do it this day when I make a mistake on a trade. Because if if I do a technical mistake on a trade, then I want to correct that ASAP in my brain. I simply replay that trade five, six, seven times in the correct way, uh, where I manage my trade correctly, where I execute the entry and exit correctly and so on, to just override the other experience. And I think that's that's works really well for me. So that's how I do it. Mm. Okay. I, it's very interesting. And I, I like the way you explained it because in my opinion, there are a lot of traders that focus on back testing and, and they put a lot of energy into running back tests. And, and it does have some real limits to how useful it is in real time. And to your exact point, just the results you get with the back test will probably look very different from a forward test, even if you could execute it because the markets are just so dynamic and changing. And I think what you would say is back tests I would say would fall under what I would just even call chart replaying. And very, um, I think it's very important as well to take trades that you did not trade the way that you should have. There was some kind of an error there. And to go back and just replay those with a tool that will allow you to execute in real time. Um, like I use CR charts, but this, this is a built-in feature where you can just back up the chart and you can play it you know, in, in hindsight. Uh, but similar thing. And fix those mistakes and try to execute that as, as you know, perfectly as possible every time. Um, yeah, it's a great exercise. Very, uh, very, very, very powerful. Yeah. Um, could I ask when you look at your, your trading right now, is there any kind of a personal issue that you say like, yeah, this is the thing I'm, you know, kind of working on right now. That's kind of creeping back in with my performance or something. I have always had the issue of, um, this, this, but that is not a trading itself related. Uh, this uh, feeling of not doing enough. yeah. So when I'm waiting for a trade, <laughs> I just try to keep busy. And instead of doing something that, uh, I don't know, painting or whatever, <laughs> I try to create new strategies. So now I, I have a portfolio of these, I don't know, 50 plus strategies, which I can't all execute. So I always have to cherry pick or which strategies I want to actually use. And it's, it's just this addiction. I'm like a chartaholic or so. It's really hard for me to stay away from the charts and to not create new strategies and to not look at, I, I don't know. For example, I look at these 28 pairs that I have and I swore to myself, that's what I'm going to stick to. And then 
of course it goes well for one week two weeks and then i have one day where i'm like yeah today i want to look <laughs> at this pair maybe like the usd mexican which i usually never trade but uh, i saw it's moving so let's try to pick a trade there you know so i just always have this feeling of not doing enough and that that's not a trading problem itself it's just a mindset problem which i uh, i have gotten better at it because i've had a burnout in the past because of that as well and that was no fun that took like a year to get over i'm working on that and that's always my biggest challenge yeah hmm. interesting uh, just like curious when you say not doing enough is it like a um, work ethic thing where you feeling uh, a pull to lazy or is it like a personal worth thing where you feel like you're which end of that do you think it falls under? I think both pretty much because, uh, yeah, the, the way I was raised and also um, from from the poker industry and I was always very competitive. And if I don't put in the time, I can, I can feel good about myself when I'm losing, when I know that I gave everything. And if I don't do that, then I also lose a lot of confidence and you cannot trade without confidence. Yeah. So this confidence that I need for my trading process, I get from grinding like a madman. Yeah? And that's simply something that yeah, I have to work on. It's it's maybe less about self-worth, but indirectly, yes, because when I win, I feel great about myself as well, of course. And uh, I always want to be the best trader on the planet. So there's some ego involved as well. But in the end, it's just this, I know deep down that I need that confidence to execute my trades relentlessly. And the only way I know how to get that confidence is by working hard. Yeah. yeah. It's a it's a crazy dynamic of trading where yeah. I think in every other venture in life, whether you're doing a school project, whether you're working, whether you're in a sporting event, if you are not doing something, you're doing something wrong. Like you should mm -hmm. be, you know, uh <laughs> doing something active. And when we come to our trading, the idea of not doing anything is a, is a weird part of our job, that strategic patience. And I've had to reframe this in my mind a lot about the idea of doing nothing and mm. reframe it to the idea that I'm doing patience. It's not nothing. I'm doing the act of being patient. And this is a part of my job. Um, but it, it, I think it's a very normal struggle in trading. And um, yes, yeah, very, very, uh, it comes yes, for all everyone has that. I, I think every student asks me, like, what do you do when you're waiting for trades? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. waiting. <laughs> I've been right, right, right. Active waiting, you know. Listen to music. I don't know. Watch some documentaries. Do whatever you have to do to not do something stupid. Because the longer you look at the charts, the higher the chance you're gonna do something stupid. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I think a nice <laughs> thing you said as well about how, protecting your confidence and not being able to trade without confidence. And it's it's amazing to me how I can get beat up by the market. And if I know that I did the best of my ability, even I think I'm okay sometimes realizing what happened today was outside the scope of my ability to be able to handle that or to understand that obviously a day went really well where I traded well. But what really starts to, to dip into my confidence and my, my frustration levels and my ability to just have a happy life, honestly, is when I know I'm beating myself, when I know I'm, I'm starting to just perform very poorly. And tr trading well, there's a lot of reasons for us to trade well for PL and for, for everything else, but it's just also connected to where if we do bad decisions, it's not just the PL that's getting hit. It's not just that side of things. It is also attacking at your confidence and your ability to know that you can do the right thing. And when you start to, you know, to your point, dipping into that, it gets trading gets to be a very dangerous thing um and and any kind of progress will will be halted or or you know at some level impossible once that emotional capital starts to get chipped away at we got to really safeguard that yeah yeah and it takes forever to rebuild it <clears throat> that emotional capital once you burned out or you lost that it takes forever and it, some some people never regain it because uh they cannot get it back without professional help or a trading coach or yeah it's just really tough so that's what I always say, like you have to protect your mental capital and it's the most important thing you have because without it, you can't do anything. Yeah, it's a really good point what you just said of how you could lose it literally in a day and yeah. there's no way to gain it in a day. No matter how yes. well you do something in one day, you will never get it back. It has to be 
the right decisions over long periods of time, but you could lose it in one day. And uh, that's a fascinating dynamic to guard ourselves against, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Hey, can I ask you this? What do you think about market manipulation? You're in, a, you know, especially being in the Forex type market. So, I mean, FX is a decentralized um, market, right? So if you would want, firstly, if you would want to manipulate the Forex market, you would need to have billions of dollars, I guess, because the liquidity is absolutely insane in Forex. Um, the problem is that it's decentralized. So the data feed I'm seeing on my broker could be different from the data feed you're seeing on your broker. Typically on the euro dollar or so, they are similar uh, to the PIP. But if you go to an exotic pair like the US dollar versus the Czech krona or so, it gets funky. Yeah? So the brokers themselves would manipulate the, uh, the charts to, for example, a lot of their customers do have their stop loss beneath a certain level and they just trigger that to make a lot of commission and spread right and then they say oh yeah that's just how it went for our data feed or for our liquidity because where these brokers get their liquidity is of course uh, major liquidity providers like Deutsche Bank and stuff like that but some of these smaller brokers they they have liquidity providers that are not very let's say liquid <laughs> and um, a lot of the trades don't even for, for some brokers the, the trades, your trades don't even go out to the market. Yeah. So they simply see that you trigger the stop loss and they put the money somewhere else. <laughs> oh, <laughs> magic, magic. Yeah. So you have to be really careful where your broker is uh, regulated in the FX space, especially. You should go with a AAA regulated broker. Australia is great. EU is great. America is great. If your broker has its regulation from Seychelles, something like that, don't do it. Yeah. Don't send them their money. They also don't have the money in a in a in a separate AAA bank. They have it somewhere in their accounts. They could do whatever they want with that money. Uh, so it's just yeah, dangerous. And in, in in stocks, market manipulation is a totally different story because there are such illiquid stocks. And also, a guy like Elon Musk can manipulate a stock with a tweet. Yeah. You cannot um, manipulate a currency with a tweet, even though a while ago there was there was a, a Twitter account that looked like the official White House representation account, and they said something really stupid happened. I don't know, Air Force One crashed or so, and that even moved the U.S. dollar pairs a bit, like a couple of uh, pips. So quite interesting, yeah, the market manipulation in this regard. But overall, in FX, you are quite safe. If you are with a regulated broker, it's almost impossible to to manipulate the market because of the massive liquidity. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I would imagine that you have a lot of products you're trading and potentially maybe multiple type indicators that you're looking at. Let me ask you this. You have a blank chart. You can only put one product to watch. You can only have one time frame, and you can only use one tool or indicator. How are you setting it up? <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll I'll use the GBP USD, uh, British pound versus the dollar because um, that that pair moves in a very technical um, way. It just respects a lot of levels. So if I can't use indicators, I have to use support resistance levels. Something and uh, GBP USD tends to respect those very well. I would use the one hour time frame because if if I can't use multi time frame, I think it's really hard to trade on the lower time frames, five minutes, one minutes, and so on. So I would go a bit up in time frames, uh, maybe the one hour, the four hour charts, look for technical levels, uh, really strong levels on a chart. And then I would use an RSI, for example, yeah, with the standard settings and try to look for either overbought, oversold as a trend following strategy. So when we approach a strong level, we break out of that level. And then the RSI shows overbought for a long trade. That that that's a good signal in itself. You can do that. Or if you get divergence on the RSI into that level and price flattens out, you can look for a reversal trade. Yeah. You probably wouldn't get too many trades per week on a one hour chart, but if you know how to pick your levels, that could very well be a, the only strategy you need. Yeah. Yeah. I, um... Would you say the maybe like 90% of your trades are trend following going in the direction of the action or maybe more? Uh, 
Yes, pretty much. Yeah, I I've always been a trend follower. I don't I don't even know why. It just feels natural for me that if something goes up, it must go up more. <laughs> Some people have a lot of problems with that. For me, it was always logical. Like if you look at inertia and momentum and so on, it takes much more energy for something to go the other way when it's already starting to roll. So I was always looking for something that had already made a nice move, a nice breakout, anything like that, and then just a consolidation. So a breathing point where the market can catch its breath. And then I look for that second move. That was always my favorite trade. And that could also be early in the trend, right? If you have a very long uptrend and then you have a break of that uptrend and then a pullback, and then you get in at right that point, those are one of my favorite trades as well. Yeah. And the way you're describing that second scenario there, is that a, uh, you consider that a reversal trade or do you consider that catching the new trend very quick? Very I, quick? I, I consider the very early new trend uh, yeah, trade. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's, you said some people struggle with it and, and for you, it's been somewhat natural. It's um, it, I'm on the other side to where it is. I am very skeptical when it looks like the market is doing something. I just have a natural impulse to expect that this is lying and this is, <laughs> it's, it's going to turn. And what's um, your asset class? Oh, futures exclusively. Um, the okay. S&P 500 is, you know, my bread and butter. I'll, I'll, I'll trade that primarily. Um, but you also you don't trust the, the trends on the S&P 500? <laughs> I don't trust anybody or anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah, it's, it's, there's something in, in uh, it, it's been my experience with almost everybody that you're probably on one side of that or the other to where the idea of uh, joining the action is a little bit more natural and to fight it or to do some kind of like an outside back in type of trade is very difficult for you. Or on the other side to where when the market is at its extremes and you're looking to fade those back into some type of value, it's a much easier, just feels more natural. And if the market is going in a direction to try and just get on board with that and join it can be tough. Uh, but anyway, it, to say I'm on the other side of it to where I really enjoy <laughs> looking at the at the extremes of a, a, a value as the way that I would see it, but looking for those kind of outside back in, they're just so much more comfortable for me. But it's always interesting to hear with somebody, just our natural tendencies. And I think the aptitude- That's an important point, actually, because um, the, the, uh, the friction you have, your personality has with your strategy should be absolutely minimized. Yeah, I always tell that my students, like if, if you don't like my strategy- then there has to be a reason for it. And it's much easier to switch the strategy than to switch your personality. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. And this is a really strong point when people are thinking about how I should trade. Mm -hmm. I don't think this really ever comes into the conversation typically, but, but it's mm -hmm. one of the most important things because to your point, if you find yourself naturally have more of an aptitude to be a contrarian and you're trying to force yourself to join the action, mm -hmm. The amount of discipline and work that you have to do to try and create that skill or to try and to, to build that into you, as opposed to just leaning into what's natural, it's just night and day difference. Yes. Um, yeah. So really, really, really important to get that right about yourself. And yes, it can feel and also your lifestyle, right? And like if, if you... I mean, a lot of people, they, they have this idea to, of becoming a day trader when they still have their nine to five job. So, okay, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And then a lot of people want to get away from the computer and have this freedom. You have, I mean, trading, when, when you think about trading, what kind of emotions does it give people? It's always the first thing that comes up is freedom, right? I don't want to work for my shitty boss anymore. I don't like my nine to five. I want to buy my family, this and that. All of that is connected to freedom, right? And then suddenly you're sitting in front of a computer 10 hours a day. How is that freedom? So you have to be very, very um, yeah, aware of A, what is your personality? And B, what is your current lifestyle? And C, what is your lifestyle that you actually want? So uh, I, I've seen a lot of people, I ask them, why are you a day trader? They say, because I can make more money. And I have more trades. I say, yeah, but are you actually happy doing that? They say, no, not really. But, you know, so <laughs> good luck with that. If if you are not happy uh, with your trading style and then you go into a drawdown, uh, it's going to be one hellish nightmare. Yeah. So yeah. you have to be really aware of all that stuff. Yeah. And there's a certain element of this business that is an art. And it, there is a creative side to this that is not, it's not just a black and white push these buttons. And 
if you are doing something that's making you miserable or you are just not um, not happy, that plays a very big role. The same way if you were trying to create something and you're all stressed out about stuff. And this is a constant thing I have to monitor because um, it will, the markets will just kind of grind you down if you don't mm -hmm. have these things in place to help get these breaks and help get you back centered. And if you're stressed and if you're not happy with what's going on, you're sitting here trying to trade, like you, it, it won't work out for you well at all. Uh, stuff. Yes. You know. And in the FX space, I mean, it's 24-5 market and crypto is worse. It's 24-7 market. So if you really want to, you can you can actually ruin your life with it and sit in front of the computer all day long. I was always jealous of uh, stock traders because they have this eight-hour session and then they are done. Like they, they don't even have in the back of their minds this temptation to trade, right? That took me a long, long time as well um, to simply say, okay, I'm trading these three hours and then I'm done. No matter what happens, I'm done. Uh, and yeah. then I try to push it away. Yeah, yeah. That takes a lot of discipline for for anybody to do that. Yeah. Do you think when you're thinking about people and trading, do you think that people are born to trade in the sense like they're born with natural aptitudes that are just going to make them good at trading and they are born with natural aptitudes where trading is just not for you? <laughs> I have I have never seen a natural born trader. I have seen natural born anti-traders. <laughs> I don't think they were born that way. But when when you come into trading, you are already at least 18 years old. So you have a lot of life experience already. You have your personality already and your work ethic and everything. And then suddenly this trading thing comes and you apply all your beliefs and what in your dreams and everything onto trading. And that's uh, usually a huge clash of it's a reality check, firstly. Because everyone who goes into trading thinks they're going to be a millionaire in a year. Everyone. Yeah. I have never seen a single person that didn't think that. Mm. And uh, that that's why a lot of people simply stop after six months and a year. Because they are not a millionaire yet. And the people that stick with it, they are the very stubborn people like, uh, like us. Um, <laughs> and we simply don't like to uh, give up. Yeah. No matter how hard it might be. And then some people can make it in two years. Some people make it in 10 years. I think everyone has, I asked another trader that question actually, and he said, um, do you know what your minimum IQ has to be to um, to handle live ammunition in the US Army? <laughs> what is this? A, a 70. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can handle live ammunition, <laughs> you can also be a trader. You don't have to be very smart here. Yeah. You just need to be able to follow a couple of rules and um, uh, have discipline, work hard, and so on. I have a friend. He has um, zero higher education, yeah, no master, no bachelor, and so on. Fantastic student, fantastic trader. He became, after a year of mentoring from me, fantastic, yeah, really good. So I don't think anyone, I, I think anyone can be a trader, but I also do think that some people do have prerequisites and beliefs that are not very conducive and they have to get rid of those first like money is evil or yeah working hard is for idiots and stuff like that you know or they saw wall street and with gordon gecko and they don't want to be like him and stuff like that yeah it's just it all leads to self-sabotage when you think about markets and you sit down to trade do you have a worldview that you bring into it like potentially I'm you know I'm sitting down to a financial warfare or I am uh, you know this is an art that I'm I'm doing and I'm a painter uh, any kind of like a underlying um, paradigm that you approach the market with So I always had a problem um my education is um how do I say that my father was uh, was a member of the German Communist Party and my education was very, uh, yeah, left on, on the liberal side, I would say, yeah. So going into the financial markets is obviously the complete opposite of um, that that mindset, yeah. Um, so I had to reframe it for myself. Otherwise, I would have kept sabotaging myself. So the way I do it is simply uh, when I make money in FX, I take it away from the banks and they have enough money anyway. And they're the bad guys. So, I mean all good all good for me you know you only need a belief that works for you and you can believe anything and mm -hmm. you can you can kick out all your beliefs and fill your brain with completely new beliefs and uh, that's that works very well if you do it in the right way so for me 
I'm I'm basically Tyler Durden, who's trying to blow up the banks by making shit lots of money, and I, <laughs> and I don't have any problem with that, um, so to speak. I, I I think it's always funny when when people say, "Oh, look at Bernie Sanders, he's a communist or he's a lefty, but he's also a millionaire." That doesn't go well together. I say that goes very well together. If if a person works hard, let them earn their share. That's totally fine. Yeah, and you can still be pro society and don't be an egoistic idiot. Yeah, it's uh. You said something that was one of the best things I've heard in a while. You said you only need a belief that works for you, and you can believe <laughs> anything. Yeah, that is so <laughs> profound, and it is so <laughs> wildly true, and. <laughs> If you're not careful, uh, you don't pick what you believe and you, yes. you still believe a lot of things. It's almost like the, the burden of, of being a human that has these conscious thoughts that we have. To, we all believe something. And if you don't choose it. Uh, but anyway, the idea you can believe you only need a belief that works for you and you can <laughs> believe anything. That was yes. I'm glad you said that. Can I ask you this? What is the biggest thing that you do to help, like maybe the biggest action you take that you think helps your performance? So not like the technical skill side of trading, but the ability that you have to stay off tilt and and stay present and execute. Uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds cliche, but uh, meditation helps me a lot to to stay to stay grounded. So I couldn't trade without doing my meditation. Yeah, that's just because it helps me so much to get centered and to just like. Yeah, as you said, stay present and come into the moment. Even if my, for example, best best example, I had a I had a crash in the morning with my motorbike. It was very, it wasn't very severe, but the other guy it was his fault. And he just swerved into my lane, didn't see me at all, and uh, I loved that bike, and it was broken. And then, and then, so you know, horrible morning. Then I come into my trading office. That's a day where I, typically I wouldn't trade. Um, mm. Then I sat down for a meditation. I made it longer. I made it an hour meditation. And after that, I felt fantastic. And I was able to trade and it was a good day. It was a productive day. Uh, so I really think that helps me personally a lot. And also when I had my burnout, I really needed to get back into touch with myself. Yeah? And meditation, man, <laughs> it's just crazy stuff, right? And my grandpa always did that without knowing it. He said... He always said to me, "Yo, when when is the last time you sat beneath a tree doing absolutely nothing, like not even reading a book, just sitting there?" And I said, "I have never done that in my life." So yeah, you should try it. Mm. <laughs> That's great stuff. Yeah. If you only do it for twenty minutes a day, it already has profound benefits. I think for everything, not just trading. When you're doing your meditation, do you include any type of an app or a thing? Or is it truly just kind of the art of doing nothing where you sit there and just try to stay present with your breathing? Or Yeah, I started in the beginning um, with with an app because it's something you have to learn too. Yeah, being alone with yourself and your thoughts, that's some, that's some crazy stuff um, <laughs> for some people, um, sure. uh, for most people probably. And I used to be the kind of guy that would listen to audiobooks to fall asleep because I couldn't stand being alone with my thoughts in the evening uh, in bed so yeah uh, i started with an app uh, waking up by sam harris fantastic i think uh, i really like him anyway and his books and that app helped me a lot and now i just do do it by myself yeah so i have uh, i have an alarm clock and i have this very sweet bell sound and for the first 15 minutes i just let every thought flood my mind i just Whatever my brain wants to think about, let it do. Uh, I don't care. And the craziest shit comes up from 20 years ago, some weird situations or whatever, you know. Um, and then after 15 minutes, I switch into silent mode. Then I tell my brain, okay, now you have gotten rid of all the stuff that you wanted to show me. And um, now it's my time. Yeah? Now I have some quiet time. And then I focus 100% on my breath. And I do that for another 15 minutes and try to become as centered and quiet as possible. Very nice. Very, very cool. So it's meditation for the ability to perform. What would you say is the biggest action you take to help your trading skill? For my trading skill, it's definitely reviewing. Yeah. I mean, it sounds cliche as well, but in trading, we don't have a coach. Uh, I mean, most of us, I, I had a couple of coaches, but I don't have anyone who stands behind me when I'm trading and tells me what the hell are you doing? Or you have to do this different way. You have to do that in a different way. And you need a feedback loop. 
like if, if if you don't create that feedback loop yourself and you are not your own coach you're never going to get better there is no learning by doing and trading yeah, you you just don't learn and i have i have met one successful trader in my life that didn't have a trading journal <laughs> one and he, even he could be much better with a trading journal so it's just lazy right but yeah those 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 after session reviews that journaling that writing down what the go well what didn't go so well having a chart book of my best trades that i can go through so i know like training this pattern recognition and everything when the journal to me is just the absolute backbone of my trading operation and if i ever lose that then uh, i'll be in big trouble i guess so i have like 500 copies <laughs> You do it with physical books or do you do it digitally? Uh, well, we have uh, the Edgewonk app, right? So I'm also a co-founder of that. Which you co-founded online... Edgewonk? Yes. Oh, that's really <laughs> interesting. I didn't yes. know that. That's also us, yeah. <laughs> wow, very cool. That's a. I know a lot of people that use Edgewonk. Hmm. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, that's also our baby. So basically in the, in the beginning, I had my trading journal. It was an Excel file. It was a crazy Excel file. And then Rolf had one, and then we wanted a goodie for our users from Trade Society, uh, so they could sign up for the newsletter. So I said, "Yo, let's just combine this um, these two journals because he had some great ideas, I had some good ideas." And then I sat down. That time I was in uh, Bangkok, I still remember. And I went into this OCD mode for two weeks, and just I don't know where the time went, but it was, suddenly I had this crazy Excel sheet yeah, with huge and a million functions. And then Rolf said. This is way too good to give it out for free. <laughs> let's try to sell it. I was like, who's going to buy an Excel file? Are you nuts? Uh, let's just try. Okay. Okay. Then we sold shitloads of those Excel files suddenly. And I was flabbergasted. So we had enough money to hire programmers and do like a real professional journal. And that's how it went. And for the last eight years now, it's um, ever, ever growing. Funny thing is we were basically the first journal on the market. There was one other guy in Las Vegas. And uh, he was he was probably very mad at us because we came into his space. Um, but there was only us. And now there are so many products like uh, a competitor product like Edgefunk. Yeah, interesting. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not grateful for the competition. I don't like them. But uh, it's good for the traders um, that they can choose a great trading journal product because, man, it's just so, so, so important. And not everyone knows how to use Excel to build their own or that doesn't have the time. So yeah, it's fantastic. Very good. Okay. So meditation for the performance and being involved with the reflective process of looking back and, and making improvements, journaling for the skill side of things. Uh, yeah. Those are strong, strong points. And it's, it's, you know, I think it's something that's very interesting is there's a lot of uh, basic things that are so incredibly difficult to do, you know, simple, but not easy. And there's a lot of simple things that are not effective at all. And I think navigating any space is hearing all of this noise and trying to separate out like these things are relatively simple. And I need to focus on the, these are the things I need to focus on. And just being able to get that amount of wisdom, I, I, I really feel takes a lot of time in any type of space because there's so many things people talk about that are just so stupid. And then there are things that people talk <laughs> about that they are so deceptively simple that you might not put the importance of how, you lose the importance of how powerful this topic actually is. The idea of meditation, the idea of journaling, you know, who doesn't talk about this, but at the same time, try to sit down and for 30 straight days, meditate every day without missing, and then try to journal every day without missing. Good luck to you, you know? And <laughs> that doesn't mean you're a stupid person. you look at the best athletes in the world. They have entire teams of people that are just designed to help them sleep, eat, you know, because uh, these things are incredibly hard to do every day. And as yes. traders, we've got to hold ourselves to these things. So very cool. Very cool. Listen, I know that we are out of time and I, I really have enjoyed chatting with you. I could keep this going for a lot longer, but where would you direct somebody if they wanted to um, find more about you or, or maybe just keep up with you or find out more about what you do? 
simply go to our Trade Society YouTube channel. That's uh, where we put out the most content. So it's youtube.com slash Trade Society. So it's not Trade Society, but Trade Society. Yeah. Mm, um, yeah. Funky German word games. <laughs> <laughs> and for Edgewonk, it's edgewonk.com. If you want to take a look at our trading journal, I personally, um, I only have, um, um, well, I don't use social media a lot. So if you want to follow us on Twitter, that would be Rolf's uh, account. That's also Trade Society on Twitter. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Once again, big thank you for coming on and, and uh, thank spending you. the time with us. I'll pause the recording and then we'll I'll say goodbye to you proper, but we'll say goodbye All to right. everybody right here. Thanks very much.